Welcome to a Crime Lines bonus episode. I think at the beginning of the year I called these after shows, but they've less been about my episode for the week and more about other things and opportunities to talk to other podcasters. So I'm just going to call it a bonus episode. I'm not creative enough to come up with a clever title for what these episodes are. I feel like a lot of my conversational or crossover episodes, whether I do them here or on Patreon, are so often with other podcasters you've already heard from because I just kind of pull from my existing friend pool because it's so much easier to get people to come on your show when you can just text them and they're your friend and they feel kind of trapped into doing it with you. So it's great in that regard. But I have been broadening my horizons and reaching out to new people. I have a really great crossover coming up in October that is going to be haunted ghost story based. And it's also writing based. So if you're interested in hearing about different ways to write, I have that crossover coming with Southern Gothic. But I've also been having some new podcasts slip into my inbox asking about promo swaps or buying ad space. And if it's a podcast I'm enjoying, I tell them to just come on for an interview instead if they would like to do that. And that is how I met Helen Molesworth with Death of an Artist podcast. There are two episodes of a six-part series out now. You can listen to all six on Pushkin Plus at pushkin.fm. I got to listen to all of them ahead of time because I'm doing this interview, so of course I said, yeah, send those over. I spoke with Helen Molesworth, who, like I said, is the host, and she is an art historian. And I also spoke with the producer, who is Maria Luisa Tucker, who is also a journalist. Before we just jump into an interview, I do want to give you some background on this case and who is at the center of it. The case is an interesting look, not just at a true crime case, but the art world and even power imbalances within it. At the core, the show is about Ana Mendieta, a Cuban-American artist who was on the rise at the time of her death in 1985. Looking back in 2018, the New York Times described her art as sometimes violent and often unapologetically feminist and usually raw. In 1979, Mendieta met sculptor Carl Andre, and Andre was not on the rise. He was actually already at the top. The two then married in 1985. Eight months later, Ana Mendieta died at the age of 36 when she fell or was pushed from the apartment she shared with her new husband during an argument. Andre was charged in her death, and that became the central question. Did he or did he not do it? Death of an Artist The podcast will ask more than just that question. You'll hear more about that in the interview that I play in a minute. But what I wanted to point out here without giving like spoilers of how things turn out is that Andre made a choice in his trial that has come up here on Crime Lines again and again recently in the Lloyd Rainey trial, in the Dennis Oland trial, and then in my recent Patreon and Apple subscription bonus episode, in the case of Carrie Farver. The person charged in her case also made this choice. Carl Andre opted to be tried in front of a judge only. Because Andre is a minimalist artist, it was quipped that he opted for a minimalist trial by avoiding the grandstanding that often happens in front of juries. So Death of an Artist is a podcast that is going to follow this case, but also bring in all that rich context and history that I like to do here on Crime Lines, but am somewhat limited in doing because I do one case per episode. This podcast takes six parts to tell you a rich and compelling full story, bringing in art history, as well as looking back on the case with a modern lens when exploring some of the same issues that Ana Mendieta explored with her art, including feminism and violence. 
It's a true crime story that is willing to look at other issues. This case is controversial legally speaking, but also within the art world, and the host and producer are not shying away from that. Thankfully, when I recorded this, both Helen Molesworth, the host, and Maria Luisa Tucker, the producer, were available to talk to me, so you will hear from both of them in the interview. And without further ado, here it is. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Helen Molesworth. I'm the host of the podcast, Death of an Artist. And in my everyday life, I'm a, an art historian and a writer. And I'm Maria Luisa Tucker. I'm the producer of Death of an Artist. It's a co-production between Pushkin Industries and something else, a Sony Music Entertainment Company. So as an art historian, you you are familiar with this story before you decided to bring it to a podcast, right? I was as a as someone who specializes in contemporary art and for listeners who don't know what that means, that basically means the art of basically from the 1960s forward, we call contemporary art. Uh, so that most of the artists who we think about are folks who are alive or recently passed away. So this is a story that's known in the art world, but rarely if ever discussed. And in the wake of, I think, the Me Too movement, probably most importantly, it just felt like it was time to think about whether or not us rarely discussing it held water anymore. Why did you choose to take this story to the podcast form versus other media like a book or a documentary? Well, it turns out that I love podcasts. Like I'm a fan. Like I imagine many of your listeners are fans of podcasts. I'm a podcast fan. And I really was a radio kid. You know, I used to lie on the floor of my bedroom as a child with a transistor radio on my chest, just moving the dials around. I loved radio and I love being read to. I love it when someone tells me a story. And so the podcast form is just really interesting in that way because I get to be on the other side of that. And I love, I love the idea that I'm kind of like sitting in somebody's ear, that I'm in your headphones or I'm in your car radio and I'm telling you a story. I, I love the form. And so it seemed like a great opportunity. And then the other reason I think it was interesting to bring it to podcast form is the museum world isn't interested in telling this story in exhibition form. So the podcast world is a way to get around the prohibitions of the museum world at the moment to try and get this story out there and talk about it in a new way. And can I also add, um, it, I think it works really well as a podcast because part of the reason is because we were able to get access to all of these audio interviews that had been conducted in the 80s by a journalist named Robert Katz. And just hearing some of those voices, and, and many of those voices are people who are who have passed away since. So hearing some of those voices kind of tell the story more in real time really lends itself to the podcast form. With this being a almost taboo topic within your circles, did you get resistance from sources to talk? And did you have friends tell you, no, don't do this? Uh, both and. Um, yes. We got turned down lots of people who I thought would talk to us uh, because they didn't want to be on the record publicly, because they didn't want to revisit the trauma, because they just didn't want to touch the third rail of this story. I had a couple of people say to me, oh, that's brave. And that's always a, what what's it called? Like damning with faint praise or something. You know, when someone tells you you're brave, they're also kind of telling you that you're being stupid. And so, yes, there was definitely a little pushback. So thankfully you had these tapes though, because some of the people on the tapes not only have some passed away, but some don't want to talk anymore, right? That is correct. Although we didn't I don't think we used any tape of people who turned us down. Maybe we did. I'm not sure. Louise says, like, no comment. 
We use tapes that we had permission to use, and all of those folks whose voices you hear in our podcast are people who were quoted in Robert Katz's book that he that he did all of this reporting for. So, you know, for the most part, most of the voices that you hear in our podcast are uh, people who have spoken public. Well, no, all of them are people who have spoken publicly about. The, about Anamendita's death and Carl Andre's murder trial before. They've all spoken publicly about it before. So you mentioned that the Me Too movement was part of what got you thinking about telling the story. So what is the what is the lesson here? What's the question at the center of this podcast that you're setting out? What what's the big picture end goal here? One of the most important things I think that the Me Too movement did was insist that we listen to women and that we listen to women who have been harmed by powerful men in ways that impinge on not only their personal freedom, their bodily autonomy, but their professional standing. And it seemed to me that this story had all of the hallmarks of a Me Too story in that regard. And I think that the other thing that Me Too did and that this story does is really ask us to think about, I mean, at our at, a, at my most basic level, and I find it painful to talk about sometimes, like to really ask us to think about how we value women. You know, like, do we value women's lives? Like, literally, it's that basic. Like, are we a culture and a society prepared to value women's lives? And given how many women are killed by people that they know, men they know, that are male intimates, we have to, ha- we have, to have these conversations publicly and compassionately and ethically in order to you know, create a more just and equitable society. It's like, to me, it's like that basic. And can I, I would add to that also, I think that one of the things that this show does is talk about how, I think we have a resistance to the idea of someone who is super talented or really great in some way, or a cultural icon, that that person must also be good. And I think that you know, we talk about this in the show, not just speaking in the world of, of art, but also, you know, talking about filmmakers and comedians and other people who are considered so great in their form. They may also, they may both be super talented and also have harmed people. And I think it's hard for us to hold those two things in our mind at once as a society. So I think that's something that we try to explore through the story of Anna Mendieta and Carl Andre. That's interesting because it's really something that the true crime community, um, creator community with podcasts primarily, because that's, you know, the field I'm in are having a bit of a reckoning with ethics. And that is one of the conversations that have come up since one very popular podcast host who's done documentaries, who's done, you know, TV shows written books, the whole nine yards, very high profile, has been accused of sexual harassment, was fired from his network, lost his show. And the separation of him as a person who contributes to victim advocacy, while also being someone who has allegedly victimized people. And it's a conversation we've been having for several months now. And it's just part of the broader impact of Um, talking about ethics within the true crime space. We are moving out of that sensational entertainment side of things, which is one of the reasons I, you know, I listened to the, your podcast, I got the advanced listen. So I was very excited and was able to, I don't want to say vet as though I'm some arbiter of ethics, but listen to it and say, how are you approaching this? And I really do commend you for being able to handle a very sensitive topic 
a a case somewhere where the, one of the people who falls under suspicion is still alive. You handled it very, very well. And I want to commend you for that. Thank you. That's great to hear. We tried, I think, really hard. And Louisa and I have different disciplinary training. I mean, she's trained as a journalist and I'm trained as an art historian. So I think we, I'm really just, I'm so glad to hear you say that because I feel like we had a lot of those conversations internal just to us working together. And also we were in a, we're a shotgun marriage, you know, like we didn't know each other. Like we were, we, we got paired together. So part of how we got to know each other was also in part talking through these ethical questions and we're different generations. So we also have different generational ethics as well. And I think that all of that actually really contributed to the, what I would call like the, the ethical texture of the podcast. It was something that it was, it's almost like ethics is like a character in the podcast. Like we were very, that was a very conscious thing that we were doing we were talking about it a lot and thinking about it and trying to figure out, was there a way to tell this story? That's a story about real people. The, the perpetrator of the, of the act is, is still alive. And, and the, the person who died has family. They're real people, you know? So for me, Ana Mendieta is a public figure, but she's also somebody's daughter and aunt and sister and, friend and so how do you how do you stay alive to all of those sensitivities yeah and i would say the balance between trying to convey the horror of what happened to her on her final day without being salacious was something that we talked about and that we tried to make considered choices about. So for example, there had been, there was reporting on what the autopsy report said, and it was hard to read. So I felt, and I, I don't know if we even talked about this because I knew Helen was going to be like, mm, no, we don't need this in the show. Cause it's, that feels like we want to convey the seriousness of what happened, but I, we, we don't need to do it in a way that's going to be damaging for people that knew her, we, we tried really hard to, to have that line. That's something that comes up in true crime a lot where people are like, I like when I get all the details and I'm, I'm like, I will give you all the details, but even in death, people deserve their privacy on matters that don't, aren't part of the case. And so there are details I'll come across, like you said, in autopsy reports often that had really not that much to do with what happened or it did, but it doesn't come up again later with evidence or any of the things we need. So we don't need to get into it. And it's a decision that true crime creators make and they make it all over the spectrum of where they're comfortable. And then listeners find the shows that align with their ethics. But we do have to remember that this is somebody's trauma and even in death, they deserve privacy, but then their family deserves not to be re-traumatized by publicizing things that are not necessary to be publicized. I 100% agree. And I think with artists, I always think it's, there's this extra little wrinkle, so to speak, because if you're an artist who makes it, quote unquote, one of the things you've done is you have propelled yourself into public life. Like you've made yourself a public figure. And Mendieta's work is partly why it's so great is because it's so emotionally resonant because she really used her own body and her own history, her own identity. And she makes that part of herself very public. We see her nude in a lot of her work, for instance, you know, like, so she's already breaking down these barriers between public and private. Of course, she didn't know what would happen to her right? She didn't know we would have to tell this kind of story about her in her absence. So you have this extra wrinkle of someone who has sought out a public life, but also still wants to have a private life. And so you've got to work that line uh, even more carefully, I think. 
All right. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining me today. It was really nice to get to talk to you. And obviously, I always like an advanced listen on a good podcast. So I know that my listeners already know they can find Death of an Artist in their podcast apps. But where can they find you or the show on social media? Because I do have an engaged audience, and I'm sure they're going to have thoughts and questions as the episodes air. I'm on Instagram. And I think there are two Helen Molesworths in the world. One of us is a gem specialist and one of us is an art specialist. And I always forget whether she got Helen Molesworth or I got H. Molesworth. But you'll know the one (laughs) with the gems is not where you're going to find any information about Anna Mendieta. (laughs) You can listen to all of the episodes of Death of an Artist now on Pushkin Plus at pushkin.fm or listen one episode at a time in your regular podcast app. Thank you for listening. You can find Crime Lines on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and occasionally TikTok. Crime Lines is on Patreon, where I offer early and ad-free episodes, as well as bonus content. Visit patreon.com slash crime lines. If you want to buy me a coffee, the official drink of Crime Lines, you can give a one-time donation at basementfortproductions.com slash support. And if you need a palate cleanser after listening to heavier true crime shows, check out Rusty Hinges, an allegedly funny history, mystery, and true crime show that I co-created and write for.